So our presentation is going to be about understanding your emotions in the workplace, and also generally speaking, understanding your emotions um, throughout your day-to-day -day life. Uh, the purpose of this presentation today is to give us a way to um, understand our emotions, use theory and scientific knowledge about why we have emotions, the purposes for them, and how we can use emotion regulation strategies effectively in order to deal with unwanted emotions or reduce the severity or intensity of emotions, especially in the context of work. So what are emotions? Um, emotions are signals within your body that tell you what's happening. And the key point here is that emotions are rooted from your, from your physiological and your body response. It tells you what you should be doing and it motivates you for action. Um, there's a distinction between primary emotions and secondary emotions. And your initial reactions to what is happening are called your primary emotions. These are those strong feelings that come up quickly for you that don't involve having to think about what's happening. Um, secondary emotions are different. These are reactions to your primary emotions. So it's, it's your feelings about your feelings. And this is a really important distinction because um, sometimes one emotion could be masking a true emotion underneath. Uh, just to give an example of what that means, I might be feeling angry um, and that might be the emotion that I display and that might be my secondary emotion, but underneath that it might be guilt or it might be shame or it might be sadness. And it's really trying to figure out the distinction between your primary emotions and secondary emotions. And I think that's the first key into learning how to understand and regulate our emotions along the way. Um, so this, uh, just to answer a question in the chat. So this uh, whole re this whole presentation is is already recorded. Um, feel free to record it on your own. But this might this will be available at the end of our session today. So no need to record it if you don't have to, or if you don't want to, um, because the recording will already be available. Um, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of um, words in this presentation. Um, and so it's really hard to keep up. <laughs> so uh, feel free to just sit back and, and, and enjoy the presentation as we go along. So why do we have emotions to begin with? Um, three sort of key reasons why is that emo emotions motivate us and organi organize our body for action. Um, they kind of trigger our fight or flight response um, and flood our body so that we can effectively deal with a situation in the moment, whether that's anger, anxiety, fear, happiness, um, or perhaps a state of calm. Um, each emotion serves as a function, um, and that, that's usually preceded by an action. So think about what that looks like for you and what emotion um, leads to what specific action. Um, and that's something that we'll be talking talking about in, in a few slides. Emotions are also important because they communicate to and influence others' behaviors. And that's a really key distinction there is that our emotions doesn't, doesn't influence people's, they, they, they communicate to others how we're feeling inside. And that's one of the ways that we um, influence people's behaviors. Um, so if I'm feeling sad and I communicate to someone that I'm feeling sad, um, it might change their behavior towards me. It might reinforce a different, um, it might reinforce a behavior that I want them to. And, and that's, that comes with proper communication styles and being able to be in tune with your own emotions. So that's that third part right there, which is emotions communicate to ourselves how we feel about the situation. So there's both a interpersonal function that emotions serve between you and another person or you or a group of people or and also an intrapersonal function which is emotions communicating to ourselves so how do we communicate to ourselves what we're feeling about a certain situation um, and basically this is a really unique function that humans have is that we're able to have 
a, a system of communicating to others how we feel um, using language um, and also using body language, nonverbal cues. Um, and this this map right here is a uh, is one way to distinguish um, how we form emotions to begin with. Uh, and so take a minute and look at what this map looks like and I'll explain it uh, I'll explain more in a second. Um, as you can see here there's two sort of there's a north uh, north south and there's like an east west um, compass and so you, uh, from starting from the north south you see that uh, depending on your arousal level you can be either active or you can be quiet or passive. Um, arousal Arousal level is basically your energy level. How am I feeling and what resources do I have um, in my body? So thinking about thinking about like if you haven't had a lot of you know time to sleep or haven't had the appropriate you know, diet or you haven't had anything to eat that day, your arousal level might be high because, because your fight or flight response might be triggered quite easily. And so when you pair that with, with an event that can be perceived as either positive or negative, so this is your, your east and south, sorry, your east and west compass, um, you'll, you'll construct an emotion for you and an emotional experience that, um, that can be either happy or sad. So if my arousal level is really high and you pair that with something that is something that I perceive to be good or perceive to be positive, then high energy plus a positive stimuli will be enthusiastic or peppy or excited or, um, yeah, the thrill. <laughs> All these other emotion words that you can think of. Now, if you look onto the opposite side of that, if you have very low arousal level, so you're tired, you're fatigued, um, just don't have that much energy, and you pair that with a situation that is negative, that you perceive as negative, then you might be feeling sluggish or tired or sleepy or just passive altogether. So this is a oversimplified diagram that illustrates how emotions are constructed in our body and emotions are constructed in our, in our perception. Um, and this is based off of um, what we call the constructionist theory of emotions. So what does this all mean? It means that emotions are constructed based off of our previous experiences, our personality, um, and many other things. Um, and this is what we call emotional granularity or, yeah, emotions are constructed based on past experiences and granularity. Granularity is this concept that we talk about when we talk about emotional granularity we're talking about how many emotion words do you know how many emotions have you experienced throughout your life uh, think about granularity as granules of of something um let's say rocks right granules of sand they're little tiny sands so you have a lot more granularity whereas boulders are less granules so you have less particles um, so granularity refers to how many of the, the thing that you have. So the higher emotional granularity, that means the higher your emotion capacity or your emotion words or your emotional intelligence. Um, and that's based off of past experiences, that's based off of your personality, and that's based off of so many different aspects. Um, and the three that I've listed below are culture and language, your generation, and also the environment and the context in which you are experiencing that emotion. So when I say your emotions are constructed um, and your emotional granularity is influenced by culture and language, think about, um, think about all the different English words that you know that refer to language or to, that refer to any emotions. So like sadness, happiness, anger, um, fear, surprise, disgust, those are all your emotion words. Um, and that's just one language. That's the English language. If you're someone who is bilingual, such as myself, you might have more 
emotional granularity because you have more access to different types of words, different types of emotion words. Um, to illustrate a point, uh, have you ever have you ever had this uh, that this feeling where like whenever you see like a really cute baby um, that you feel you feel really like you just want to squeeze their cheeks because they're so damn cute. Think about what emotion you would describe to to what emotion you would uh, label to describe that experience. Um, whenever I ask people this, they they often say uh, excited, um, happy um surprised <laughs> aggressive was one that i that i heard about before but each one of those doesn't really encompass your experience altogether in a more accurate way um think about any other words and maybe you can type it up as we go along um think about any other words that you can think of to describe that experience it's probably not happy it's not that same feeling like or thrilled or even aggressive um but in the Filipino language, in Tagalog, there's a word for that, and we call it gigil, G-I-G-I-L. And whenever I say that to someone who knows what that means, they know exactly the, the emotion that I'm feeling um, and the context around which that emotion is based off of. And so I don't have to have this large explanation of like what I'm feeling inside based off of what, uh, you know, what's happening. I can just say I'm feeling gigil about this baby <laughs> how about this situation um and that's one of the ways that i can communicate to other people how i'm feeling another function of emotions um hopefully that makes sense for people and if it doesn't uh please uh drop a question at the chat function another thing as well is emotions are influenced by generation or more specifically our emotion emotional granularity is influenced by what generation we're born in. Um, another way to illustrate this point is, imagine how you convey your feelings and emotions through text message, right? How many times, um, how many emojis <laughs> do you send and what emojis mean what and what, like, and even like the LOL or is different from LMFAO. Um, and what, how do we convey uh, different types of emotions based off of what is currently available for us um, in our technical world, a tech, technological world? As, as, as all of these um, emojis are developing, it, it almost becomes like a currency for how we, we, we uh, describe emotions and how we convey our emotions. So that wasn't there in the past. <laughs> I'm sure your grandma or your great grandma may not have used emojis in the past and so they would just tell you exactly how they feel uh, but now we have all of these different ways to um, convey emotions and by extension it increases our emotional granularity and that's influenced by generation okay and lastly our emotional granularity or emotional intelligence um, is influenced by the environment and the context of which we're we're at so what i mean by that is that we all experience our emotions differently and depending on your past experiences and what environment you're in, you might be experiencing a different emotion of the same situation than your friend or someone else. Um, and that's something that we'll talk about more in the next couple of slides. So again, if you have any questions throughout this presentation, feel free to just, um, type it up in the chat function. So this little diagram right here can be quite helpful um, to build our emotional granularity. So thinking about what I said earlier when I was talking about grains of sand, the further you go out from the middle of this circle, the more words you learn to describe what you're feeling. And so that means that the higher your emotional granularity. So grains of sands are on the outer part of the circle. And then in the middle, it's those boulders, right? You don't have that many words to describe how you're feeling. So I don't know how big these, uh, this diagram is in your screen, but if you look really closely, you can see that 
under happiness, there's a lot of words to describe what you might be feeling inside, what you might be feeling in the moment. So if you look closely, someone with a high emotional granularity will be able to distinguish feeling sensitive versus feeling curious or feeling courageous versus feeling inspired. And that's what, that's what emotional granularity serves for you is the more words you know, the better you're able to describe your experience. And the better you're able to describe your experience, the better you are regulating your own emotion and understanding your emotion. So emotion, to be able to understand emotions, to be able to accurately label how you're feeling. And one of the ways to do that is to increase your emotional granularity um, and a lot of people, I think the, the term emotional intelligence have been thrown around in the past couple of the past few decades. Um, but this is one of those ways to increase your emotional granularity um, and emotional intelligence is to be able to learn more words and experience more emotions and accurately label um, your experiences in the moment. That requires a lot of work and practice. So being able to distinguish um, feeling disrespected versus feeling annoyed can serve that function for you. So I'll give you guys a minute to look through this, uh, this diagram, what we call the emotion wheel. And if you have any questions, let me know. As some of you might, might be thinking, um, if we're talking about language to describe our emotions, um, many ways to increase our emotional granularity may be to, to read more books, um, to learn a different language, or to expose yourself to different cultures that have different ways of describing emotions. Um, there's many ways to be creative about increasing your emotional intelligence. But it kind of boils down to being able to experience new things and open and be a little bit more open minded about what emotions are out there, cultures, and different um, experiences. Okay. So, how is our emotion, how does our emotions play out in our brain? Um, it's a very oversimplified diagram. Um, and each sort of point here corresponds with a, a, a part of your brain. But I'm not gonna talk too much into detail about that. Um, all you need to know is that when an event happens, it triggers a feeling inside of us. Uh, like I said before, emotions sort of motivate us for action. It kind of gathers up all of your resources so that you can act um, and do something about an event whether that event is extremely significant for you or something that's just, just kind of happening. So that event happens and what goes next? Um, the next step is your brain analyzes it. So your brain looks at that event and compares it to memories of what is, is this familiar or is this unfamiliar? So it asks that question and simultaneously what's, going, what's happening is that that trigger or that event or whatever that is, um, is being evaluated as either good or bad. So when, you're, when you, that event happens and that feeling comes up inside of us, our brain automatically um, compares it to some memories that you have. And if it's, if it doesn't, if it's something that's uncertain or um, you've never seen before, it evaluates as either good or bad. And depending on your arousal level, your energy level, um, you can have a whole different variation of ex uh, emotional experiences. So this is, again, back going back to that compass, right? You, you have your arousal level, either high or low, and different levels in between. Um, and your brain perceiving the event as either good or bad. And that's how your emotions are constructed. And we call these affective states because these are really, really small points in time um, that happen so quickly 
and it illustrates a point that our emotions kind of come comes in waves, right? It, it doesn't last very long, um, and it really just lasts as long as your um, as long as your brain is perceiving it as good or bad, and depending on how high or low your arousal level is. And this is a really important thing to consider because oftentimes when you have uncertain situations um, that cause a, a feeling that might feel confusing for you, uh, your brain fills in the gaps and creates a story. It creates a way to understand your experience and emotions come right after that. We used to think that emotions um, are random, right? Emotions are just like all these emotions just come up and we don't know why they come up. Um, but with research and time, we, we realize that emotions are actually a constructed experience in us. Um, and that's a really, really interesting, but also um, important point to know is that we, if emotions are constructed by our experiences and our, and our internal, um, you know, monologue as you said, or our perception of ourself, um, then we, we're, we're able to have more control of that. So we're able to stop it at certain points in time. If that makes sense. Uh, so the, I'll give an example to further illustrate this point. Let's say a friend sends you an irritating text message. What happened? So that that's an event that causes a feeling inside of you. And that feeling um, is evaluated as either good or bad based off of previous experiences or your memories, you often label that as bad. So you feel anger. And then that emotion usually precedes an action um, because that's what emotions do. So oftentimes when you feel angry, you wanna argue. You have this urge to argue back. You have this urge to say something back because it irritates you. Here's another situation. A friend gets angry with you. Your brain perceives that um, situation as something that is unwanted. And so you might feel sadness. What, what, what you often do when you feel sad, you might often withdraw. <clears throat> what if it's the same situation? Right, same friend gets angry with you, um, but in one person, they feel fear. And that fear usually precedes an action, which is what they usually do is imagining I'm leaving or avoiding. Um, another situation, the same situation causes a different emotional experience for a different person. So a friend gets angry with this person, instead of feeling fear, they feel happy. And so what ends up happening is they gloat. Um, good, a good example of gloating when, or feeling angry when a friend gets angry with you is when you're in a competition with them, right? Friend gets angry with you because you, you won. So you feel happy because you feel very proud and you want to gloat. Um, same situation, different emotional experiences. And try to figure out and understand what what emotional experience you have in certain situations and that is that is your own right like you don't try to compare that with other people and and ask yourself um how come i feel fear whenever um my friend gets angry with you because that's your own emotional experience your emotions are always valid in that in any situation that you're at um, and trying to understand that it will be very important for you to be able to regulate your emotions going forward. So uh, an important question to ask yourself or an important series of questions to ask yourself is when you, whenever you notice a shift in emotion, uh, you might, it might be helpful to ask yourself, you know, what was going through my mind just now? What is my emotion bringing to my attention? If my emotions are always valid, if my emotions always make sense in the moment, um, why, why am I having it? Why, what is it? bringing to my attention and how is my emotion trying to help me so emotions are neither good or bad they're just wanted and unwanted in a certain situation and certain and depending on the intensity of the emotion we want we might want to dial it down a little bit 
But at the end of the day, all emotions are trying to help you. Um, it tries to communicate to you how you're feeling inside. And so being able to open up to that emotion and listening to it is one way to understand why we have emotions and how we can go about regulating them or dealing with those emotions effectively, especially in the workplace. So basically, it starts off with curiosity. Whenever you feel a certain emotion, approach it with curiosity and try to understand it in that way. Some common emotions and action urges, so the urge to act after an emotion, um, is listed here in this table. And take a minute to read it and see which one applies most to you, right? <clears throat> I'm thinking whenever I feel angry, why am I feeling angry? Usually the perception is a goal is being blocked. So I'm angry because something is blocking my uh, the ability for me to get what I want. Whether, let's say if I was late for work because the uh, bus was late, my goal is to get to work on time. And so I'm angry because the bus is late because that, that, that blocked my goal for getting to work on time. My action urge might be to attack. Um, and that could look, in, like, look like many different things. Uh, be frustrated by, um, you know, taking it out on, on the bus driver or taking it out on someone else. Or maybe I do something completely different that anger tells me to do and I withdraw or I avoid or I turn that anger inwards. So take a minute and look at all of these different emotions and what the perception usually is and the following action urge and see which one applies to you the most. So what are emotional regulation skills? Um, emotion regulation skills or emotion regulation is how individuals influence which emotions they have, when they have them, and how they experience and express them. Uh, what's important to distinguish in this definition of emotion regulation is that emotions come and go. Right? We can't actually control what we're feeling inside. So I can't just magically make myself happy. Or if I'm feeling anxious, I can't just magically make myself feeling a different type of emotion, like just like that. But we can influence which emotions we have based off of, you know, <clears throat> based off of what we're doing, what action we're doing, and when we have them and how we experience and express them. In most models of therapy, um, most models of psychological therapy, the aim is often to teach emotion regulation strategies uh, to help people better uh, control their feelings or get better at reducing their feelings or avoid or escape painful um, emotions and feelings or get better at replacing those unpleasant emotions with good ones. Um, sometimes they work in the short term but, but over time, it's best to teach individuals to express and experience their emotions in a way that will help them act more effectively based off of who they are and what their values are. And so it's about changing our relationship to our emotions rather than changing the emotion itself. So whenever an, an emotion like, um, like sadness comes up, it's not about changing that emotion of sadness. It's about changing our relationship to it. It's about learning to be curious about why that emotion is happening for you in the moment and listening to it and try to see what can you do? How can you act right now um, that makes this situation better for you? 
So bottom line, there's no such thing as bad and good emotions. There's just wanted emotions and unwanted emotions. Um, one way to diffuse unwanted emotions, and this was uh, a point that we made last week, um, is to buy some time. Emotions come and go, and they usually don't last longer than like 15 minutes unless we really ruminate on that moment and build that emotion up. So one way, when you're feeling an emotional experience in the moment um, that is unwanted for you, deep abdominal breathing is, is one way to buy yourself some time to let that emotion come and go. Um, and exhaling slowly for about five or six seconds also induces a relaxation response and turns off that flight, fight or flight response. So when your emotions are, when you're, when you're in, a, in a high emotional state, usually your fight or flight response is turned on. So your sympathetic nervous system is turned on. And by exhaling slowly um, for longer than your inhales, you actually you actually turn on your parasympathetic nervous system. You turn on your rest and digest response. So deep abdominal breathing and longer exhaling can be very simple, but very powerful ways to let that emotion come and go. Another way as well is, is mindfulness. So being able to pay attention in the moment on purpose, um, and in the present moment, in a way that is very non-judgmental, and that's based off of what's happening for you right now. Um, and so when you introduce mindfulness in what's going on for you in the moment and how you're feeling about that situation, you can accurately label your emotional experience when you pay attention to it. And so that's where the emotional granularity piece comes very handy. So being able to accurately label, what am I feeling inside? Am I frustrated? Am I annoyed? Am I infuriated? I think this is more of a flavor of annoyed. Um, and annoyance is completely a whole different experience in infuriated. For, for people who have very low um, emotional granularity, oftentimes, everything feels the same. So anger just feels the same, um, whether you're annoyed or whether you're infuriated or whether you're rageful. Um, so you wanna be able to separate those apart and understand your labels more, understand your emotional, um, emotional experience more accurately by labeling them um, as such. And mindfulness is one way to do that. So what about reducing your emotional vulnerability to begin with? Uh, what I mean by that is reducing your vulnerability to unwanted emotions um, or the intensity of the emotions being way too high. So how do we reduce our emotions, our, our vulnerability to those types of emotions? And it starts off with this um, acronym called ABC Please, which is from Dialectical Behavioral Therapy. And the A stands for accumulating positive um, experiences, therefore accumulating positive emotions. So it's not about sort of changing our emotional experience, but or changing our emotions, but it's about giving yourself more exper positive experiences so that you have the ability to um, gain more positive emotions. The B stands for building mastery and um, well, that seems kind of straightforward, but I'll go more in depth with that in the next couple of slides. Uh, the C stands for coping ahead. This is a very, very, very uh, powerful defense mechanism that you can use, is being able to anticipate um, how you might be dealing if, with that situation effectively. So coping ahead can look like playing in your mind what you might be how you might be feeling in that moment in the future um, and how you, how you see yourself coping with that situation. Um, or if it's happening for you right now, asking yourself, how, might I, how would I be treating myself differently after I've 
cope with this uh, situation already. So C stands for coping ahead. And the last acronym, which is PLEASE, is something that I'll be talking about more in the next uh, slide as well. So starting off with accumulating positive emotions. So what you wanna be doing is you wanna build up positive experiences. Um, so do pleasant things that are possible for you right now. Um, do or do one thing that is pleasant each day. So build up this ritual so that you have um, you have more space for you to build up positive emotions. Uh, and that's something that we talked about last week as well is when we talked about how can we increase our, our emotional energy. So for, for you, um, for people who are working, um, what are the ways that you build up positive experiences at work or you give yourself or you allow yourself ways to build up positive experiences at work? Uh, it could be as simple as going outside um, for a brief period to just enjoy some sun or I guess in, in this weather, not, not so, but um, you can also go for a walk or go downstairs or go upstairs and, or call someone. And how do you build all these different rituals throughout the day and throughout your work life? Kind of going off with the, uh, the calling someone in between um, during a shift is attending to positive, uh, attending to relationships. Um, third is if you find that there's a lot of, uh, your, your vulnerability to unwanted emotions are very high. Um, there might be a lot of things that are getting in your way that you're, you might be procrastinating in the moment. Um, so avoid avoiding those things, avoid, avoiding the things that you, that's causing you stress. So if, if you have it on your mind that you have, um, a difficult conversation to attend to, or you have a lot of chores at home that's causing you stress. Um, it might be beneficial for you to attend to those things as soon as possible in order for you to accumulate more positive emotions. Another thing as well, and the fourth point is that if you look at our, our um, that in the previous slide, if you look at that emotion wheel, it doesn't look like we have a lot of uh, positive emotions in that wheel. Most of them are negative in the English language. So it's going to take more effort for you to be able to be mindful of your positive emotions. So whenever you're, exper whenever you, whenever you're building positive experiences, be mindful of what's happening for you in the moment. So if you're out with your friends or you're out with some family members and you're having a good time, pay attention to that. Pay attention to that moment, that, that moment that you're feeling in, that, in what you're doing. If you're someone like who goes on a vacation, but when they're on vacation, it's hard for them to turn off um, and they still think about other things like work, um, pay attention to that as well. That, that could cue you to, um, to switch from work mode to vacation mode, to be able to be mindful of your positive experiences in the moment. And the last point here when it comes to accumulating positive emotions is Acknowledging your worries. If you're worried about something, acknowledge it. It's there. And rather than avoiding what you're worried about, just simply acknowledging it. And if it's something that is pertinent for you in the moment, then you might want to use the avoid avoiding skill, which is to attend to that thing that you're procrastinating or you're, that's causing you immediate stress. Um, right now in the moment. And these are ways to accumulate positive emotions um, throughout your day. <clears throat> Lastly, or the, the B in ABC please is to build mastery. So that is, this is to do things that make you feel competent and effective in order to combat those feelings of helplessness and hopelessness. So plan to do at least one thing each day for a sense of accomplishment. This could be as simple as going for a walk in the morning to as big as cleaning your entire apartment, including the, um, including things that you've been putting off for a very long time. Plan for success, not failure. So do something difficult, but not impossible and increase the difficulty over time. 
Uh, a lot of people uh, during COVID have picked up hobbies that they that they finally have time to do. Um, and ultimately that's how most people have coped. A lot of people have coped during the pandemic is being able to pick up a hobby and build mastery around that. So keep doing that um, throughout your day-to-day -day life. Look for challenges, look for things that give you a sense of accomplishment um, that is gradual and, and consistent and hold yourself accountable to these to these rituals and these hobbies and these um, actions that you do throughout your day. The C stands for coping ahead. So distinguish what it means when you feel worried versus planning, right? There's a fine line between when I'm worried and when I'm actually planning um, to cope ahead. So rehearse a plan ahead of time so that you are prepared to cope skillfully with emotional situations or situations that cause um, high emotional arousal or unwanted emotions. Uh, research shows that imagining a situation um, ahead of time can cause many, fire, many neurons to fire at the same time when it, that same actual situation occurs. So being able to be mindful in that situation um, and describe what's happening for you in the moment um, before it actually happened, uh, causes you causes your brain to fire this. That's those same neurons when that actual situation occurs again, and I find that really interesting. The please in reducing your vulnerability to unpleasant or unwanted emotions is um, it's a very uh, labored acronym here. The PL stands for treating physical illnesses. So making sure you take medications and follow medical advice, or if you're feeling sick, um, stay at home and simply taking care of yourself. Because when your body is feeling healthy, um, then you are not as vulnerable to unwanted emotions. The E stands for eating a balanced diet. So something that makes you feel healthy or that's healthy for you. A is avoiding mood altering substances. So including illicit and um, not illicit drugs, caffeine um, can be included in that as well. S is for sleep and E is for exercise. Um, and for, for many of you, these this sounds very uh, common knowledge, um, but sometimes it's really important to to remind yourself that when you take care of your body, you're actually also taking care of your mind. You're taking care of your emotional um, capacity and your capacity for um, being able to deal with situations more effectively. Um, think about other things that you do already that reduces your vulnerability to unpleasant or unwanted emotions. Um, yeah, uh, so for me, like, even noticing that uh, uh, my diet um, and what I'm eating in the moment can have a huge effect on my mood and my emotion. Um, if, I, if I've eaten like a really high carb diet, um, I notice that A, uh, it's a mood altering substance for me. Um, I get a really high energy peak, which is usually followed by a really, really fast crash. Um, Sugar is also a mood altering substance. And that's something that someone said in the chat earlier. Um, think about how that usually affects your day-to-day -day, um, experience and how you experience emotions. Am I a different person when I had um, extra sugar in my coffee this morning versus when I don't? Um, and paying attention to why that happens for you and what your patterns and behaviors are. Um, and how that usually is linked for uh, linked towards a certain emotion or emotional experience that you have. So, basically, when people are able to when people are able to take more control of their emotions, they can improve the quality of their energy, regardless of external pressures they are facing. So, confronted with re relentless demands and un unexpected challenges. People tend to slip into negative emotions easily. Um, and when that, that, that slipping into emotional 
uh, negative emotions more easily, uh, you get into that fight or flight mode a lot quicker. Uh, that's something also we talked about last week as well when it came to um, the fight or flight response and how our emotional energy is also tied into that. Um, and that can happen multiple times throughout the day. People can become irritable and impatient or anxious and insecure whenever that fight or flight response is activated. Um, and that ultimately drains your energy. So if your fight or flight response is on, when there's no you know, actual thing to fly from or run away from or fight, then you're using up all of this energy and that is, and at the same time, you might be bottling up all of these emotions. Um, and so this is all very, very draining throughout the day. So that's what that first point is trying to illustrate. Uh, so to do this, one must become more aware of how they feel at various points of their workday and how that impacts your emotions and your effectiveness to deal with certain situations as they come up. So, so far in our presentation today, we looked at how do we, how do we understand emotion? What framework can we use to understand our emotions? And by understanding our emotions, we can accurately and more effectively deal with situations um, that are happening for you in the moment. Um, a lot of the skills that we've taught today was, was related to mindfulness, being able to pay attention and being able to accurately describe, observe and describe what you're paying attention to. Um, language is a really key um, way to describe what we're feeling towards other people and also to us. So utilize that and figuring out how can I, moving forward from this presentation, how can I increase my emotional granularity? Um, reading more books, um, watching more TV, <laughs> being more attuned to, uh, to your emotional experience, not just the unwanted ones, but also the wanted ones. So, so happiness, excitement, um, paying attention and actively labeling your emotions and practice doing that in order to increase your emotional granularity, um, which in turn increases your emotional intelligence. So the first step in understanding your emotions is to be able to accurately understand and label them. Um, and that's the first step to regulation. Other things we've talked about today is to take care of your body so that you're, you're less vulnerable to unwanted emotions and unwanted emotional states. 